What's up, Backgammon fans? I'm Mark Olson from Backgammon Galaxy. This is the Backgammon Galaxy podcast. And today we have a very special guest, the newly crowned UBC 2021 contender. He won the contender tournament. And now he's an official grandmaster as well, before he was unofficial. Um, Dirk Schiemann, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mark. A pleasure to be here. Hi, everybody. And yeah, uh, very excited uh, about, uh, of course, winning and now uh, being in the big final. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, still like uh, some time to go, but uh, maybe I'll also find some time to prepare a little bit. So I'm really happy about it. Yes, so you're going to be taking on the UBC reigning champion, Mochi, uh, who's won the final twice now two years in a row um but first maybe you could tell us a little bit a little bit about the how it went in the contender tournament and just for all you guys who don't know the ubc format is called the ultimate backgammon championship it's a very skill-based tournament because you get one point for winning the match and one point for winning the pr uh and in terms of a draw it's the average pr that decides who is ranked higher or who wins uh uh a match like if it's a quarterfinal, semifinal, or the final. So it's a super skill heavy format. Um, and Dieg, you beat the entire field in this uh, this year's contender tournament in Marbella. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that tournament and how it went. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was just, I mean, it was many days, very tough competition, and yeah, very hard to play six matches every day. And I took it on a day-by-day base, uh, just uh, looking, trying to perform as well as I can. And although it's a very skill-based format, uh, you always also need your lucky breaks. I mean, even the best players uh, need to get lucky lucky in a once in a while in the sense that like in the final with Kazuki, for example, I played a really bad match and uh, Kazuki wasn't able to take advantage of it. So that was just sheer luck. So it, uh, I was just trying to perform uh, well and uh, then the outcome, anything else, uh, yeah, it was just about to, uh, to happen or not to happen. Nothing I could do about it. And I, I feel also a little bit lucky that in the end it worked out so great yeah so you mentioned the the stamina uh, (laughs) the endurance effect of the tournament because it was actually very hard right we had three days of uh five matches per day Mm -hmm. and then uh from there on you qualified for the quarterfinals to day four so uh tell us a little bit about that how was it to to like really be under pressure and play so many matches and is it different from the ubc versus another tournament yeah, absolutely, because uh, it's just uh, the competition is the average competition is a lot stronger. It's just really also the PR thing. So in a, in another tournament, maybe against a certain player, you try something special for that player. You try to play the player. Of course, you cannot do that if, if, if it's also a PR competition. So it's a, a different style. And yeah, I felt like on day three, like uh, matches uh, 12 to 17 or whatever, or 10 to 15, I felt like, yeah, slipping a a little bit in my performance. So I got a little bit afraid. And then uh, the first quarter final was also, I mean, I won it, but also my performance was like, "Hmm, so, so. So I felt like, yeah, maybe I, I, I cannot make it physically to the end, but then in the semifinal, I, I, I somehow got into the groove again. Maybe that was also because uh, I really tried to uh, get all, uh, get my act together, get all the energy and focus entirely. Or I don't know. Or sometimes maybe you have a, an easier match to play. The matches are also different uh, in the skill level that you need. Some are very difficult and tough. Others are easier, maybe. So but basically, I felt in the semifinal, I got back into my, my rhythm. And so that gave me confidence again. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's you, yeah, there's a lot of interesting topics that you touch upon here. I, I kind of want to break them about, uh, apart uh, one by one. But first, let me just show the viewers here uh, the stats from the tournament because you played extremely well. Uh, so if we got the, the stats table up here, you, you can see here Dirk, uh, Dirk was the only player who played below 3.0. And this is actually very special 
because the UBC analysis settings are super tough. It's XG++ on all decisions. So it's approximately between 0.1 and 0.2 average uh, PR points lower than the BMAP uh, settings. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, Dirk uh, performed at a super, super grandmaster level. Um, Dirk, uh, in terms of your average PR, how did it go throughout the tournament? Did you start out strong and then you struggled yeah. or did you become stronger and yeah. stronger? Or how did that evolve? I, I started out strong. I think I after day two, I was like at 2.5. And then the day three came and yeah, I, I, I was slipping and slipping. And after the quarterfinal, I think I was over three even. So, and then it, it got better again after, after the semifinal. I think I only played one really bad match in the last uh, seven matches of the tournament, so to speak. So I really got, uh, got better again. So it was just like uh, starting out well, then losing it a little bit and then towards the end uh, where it mattered most it got better again what did you do in those final matches did, how did you find that extra mental energy to, to kind of go back to your a game yeah i don't know I, I i i didn't feel like i did anything different on day three but because I, I I had so many points on that day, I was already qualified basically for the quarterfinal. Maybe that didn't actually help to keep my tension high. So, so that could be an explanation. And uh, but I did nothing else in the uh, anything. I uh, didn't do anything else in the in the next day. Just did my routine. Always take the morning walk, uh, do my meditation, and all the stuff like. Uh, Really, I try to uh, do this uh, routine every day of the whole tournament. And I think that also helped me to get into the right mental state. What kind of meditations did you do? Uh, it's just a, a very popular app, uh, Headspace, uh, where you do just like, uh, yeah, control your breathing, try to do some focus stuff, like 15 minutes. I do that every day, not not only on tournaments, but I try to do that every day. So. Uh -huh. Okay, more very cool. Calmer, well, less excited. Like, it's just, I think I said it in the interview, if you're too excited, that's not good. But if you are not excited enough, it's not good either. So you have to just have the right level of, yeah, uh, emotional arousal, or I don't know how you call it. I mean, it's uh, just, uh, just the, the right level of intensity you have to find. Yeah, and I'm sure that your experience also helps you to, know yourself where, where mm -hmm. do you want that tension level to yeah, be absolutely uh, absolutely and uh, uh, but uh, it's it's easier said than done it's 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 so hard to to keep it up all the time and if you try too hard then you are losing it also because then you are just not relaxed enough so it's yeah it's, it's a difficult thing uh, i mean you can uh, practice that uh, for a lifetime i think yes okay i actually want to get into that a little bit later as well this performance element of of, of this mind sport of backgammon. Uh, but just to finish off the UBC contender tournament, mm. uh, there's one more thing or a couple more things. Something happened in the quarterfinals against Markus Reinhardt. Mm. He actually gave up before your final match. What happened there? Were he just yeah. uh, basically at 0% or was he yeah, given up? He, he felt like he was at 0%. Uh, it was the same, basically the same the situation that Kazuki found himself in in the final because Kazuki also could have continued. It was not over technically. You remember mm -hmm. he could yes. have won all the matches, all the PRs, but uh, I think he gave up because it didn't. I mean, it didn't feel well, and he didn't think it to be possible. So what in the situation because of the system with the average PR. I was leading three to one in, in matches, so he had to win the match. And then you, he had to beat me in the match by about seven PR points or something. <laughs> to uh, And then in a long match, and then so uh, I had to play at least a seven for him to have a chance uh, to... Uh, 
to catch me and I think he was also like everybody exhausted and uh, didn't feel I mean you have to ask Marcus but I think that was also a main reason of course that was also a lucky break for me because that is one fewer match to play I mean uh, so I while the others still played I could do eat my bananas or uh, took another walk or I don't know what I did, but I got some extra time and uh, one match less is, is always good. So uh, that certainly helped me. Yeah. So then you're heading into the semifinal. Was it against Thomas Muir, if I yeah, remember yeah, correctly, Danish Grandmaster. Mm -hmm. And now you're basically back in your A game and you just played like a 2X or something. Mm -hmm. Or was it even better? Yeah, it was a little bit better even, I think, uh, on the average against uh, uh, Thomas. I think it was below 2.5 even on average. I don't know. But, but yeah, better than I usually play. I mean, my average, I mean, it's like people saying when they played, uh, uh, let's say, a five, oh, I played below average. But uh, most fail to admit that uh, sometimes they play better. Uh, than average. So what I played against Thomas was also not my average. It was simply uh, better than that. I'm not as good as I played against Thomas. So just for the record. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. Really, but it was really good. Uh, probably the matches were also easier. I uh, um, Wilcox look, looked over them and he said, "Yeah, the matches." were also easier. That is also a lucky break. I had uh, some some easier matches in between that also helps to gain comfort, confidence if you play, mm -hmm. play them well. Oh, so you had uh, Will Snellings look over your matches? To, yeah, he yeah, asked me for the matches and I sent, uh, I mean, recently, like a couple of weeks ago. So, and, uh, so uh, the first ones were the matches against Thomas and he said, yeah, uh, well played, but also relatively straightforward. So, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I agree. Probably he's probably right. <laughs> this uh, there's a, all this discussion. What's my average PR? Blah blah blah. Okay. People tend to say a little bit lower than they actually feel. I f yeah, think yeah. that they should try to show up at a UBC tournament and perform mm -hmm. under pressure, like yeah. play 15 matches or 20 matches or something like this in four days, and and let's see what you and analyze it with XG plus plus as well. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. let, let's see what the average PR yeah, is really, gonna. Yeah, and and they have to take into account that it takes time to converge like uh, some because of the difference in in the skill level sometimes it, you feel you cannot really do anything wrong or anything and sometimes you have one bad game after the priming game difficult match score sometimes it goes Two nothing, six nothing, and then you have uh, Crawford games immediately, easier games, and without any cube action, and lots of factors that uh, take time to to equal out. So that's right. Forget about that as well. So, what do you? What's your intuition, uh, Dirk, about uh, how many matches does it take? You know, let's say seven point matches. Mm -hmm. uh, how many matches does it take to kind of get a reasonable estimate? Because even in a UBC here where people play mm -hmm. between 14 and 20 matches, mm -hmm. there's still some variance, right? In your yeah, average PR? Absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, 57 point matches, that should be significant. But I think with uh, 30 or something, you get a good idea or, already. So uh, and it, it's also depending on what we are talking uh, about, if it's just the... Uh, 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 that uh, if if you average should, is I mean to be one in the range of one PR point of your average that's easy that converges I think after less than ten matches you should be within one PR point of your average but uh, if it's I mean. It's about the details. I mean, you can see in the last UBC final, the differences are really small and a difference in the end after 12 matches of 0.3 is already a lot. So to get that converging in that range, it's, uh, it takes longer, I think. Yeah, there could also be a statistical thing here where the lower your PR average is, the faster you converge because the lower variance your PRs are going to get have. That's, yeah, that's true. Maybe, maybe it's better to uh, to look at it as the percentage of your PR. So like a, a 0.3 swing is for a PR3 player is the same as a 0.8 swing for a PR8 player. Yeah, that's, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so 
now you're the the 2021 UBC contender, and you're facing off against the the reigning champion Mochi, and who is uh, widely recognized as maybe even the greatest backgammon player of all time. So how are you going to approach this final? Yeah, the same as I did before, um, just uh, focusing on myself, uh, on my performance, and in the end, not try to bother too much about things that I cannot influence. For example, I mean, it's a very skill-based format, but there is also a random factor. So, for for example, it's very hard for me to see... Uh, like to beat Mochi if he wins like eight of the 12 matches, if it comes to 12 matches. I mean, then it's eight points and to to beat him uh, that many times in the PR is almost impossible. But this uh, factor who wins the match is 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 rather random. So I cannot do, if he wins eight or nine matches out of the 12, I cannot do anything about it. Or if he gets on one of his crazy streaks, like 10 matches below two, he is capable of that. Not always, but if he happens to do that against me, there's also nothing that I can do about it. Just say, yeah, great, Mochi, uh, that's that's too much for me. So it's like uh, these are the scenarios that w- which I have no influence on. I just can see, I mean, if I get a chance, uh, I hope I will be able to take it. I mean, so, so, what, so what's your see. what's your own personal expectation to your own PR for the final twelve okay, matches? So um, yeah, I think to win to have a decent chance to win it has to be better than in the uh, contender tournament. But uh, I imagine that the parameters are the same of the XG analysis. analysis. So yeah, it would be great. Uh, to be below 2.8 would be super great, but uh, I'm always saying to myself, be happy if you are below three. So that's always my goal, and it will be this time as well, and of course, of good, as good as possible. Yes, if I recall correctly, I think Mochi has been in the two point in the last two finals. I think Mochi was 2.84 or something, mm-hmm. and then 2.7. Two or two point seven four. So it's like Mochi has actually been very. This idea of convergence, you know, he's very close in both yeah, finals yeah. to this, uh, which is probably also quite uh, close yeah. to his true average average PR. Uh, I think he's probably a little bit better because remember he had in in the two finals he had a terrible day one. I mean uh, that is uh, uh, maybe he wasn't. Uh, he said it himself in an interview. I think he was maybe overconfident. Confident. He was very sure of beating Hideaki, and then he found himself in this hole after day one. And uh, I have the suspicion that uh, that's not going to happen a third time, <laughs> unfortunately for me, but good for the game, I suppose. Yes. What kind of preparations are you doing? Uh, right now, um, I'm just switching to preparing. What I did so far was. Uh, looking at all my uh, major mistakes of the UBC contender and the two tournaments after in Bad Durkheim and Trier that I played and categorize them. And I already found areas uh, where I have a lot of positions like on in one area where I made mistakes. So what next step I will do is see where my tendencies are, what kind of mistakes there are. One thing that is no secret, uh, uh, I think, is that I played on for the gammon too often. And I just, in the UBC contender, I missed some really simple double out because I had this, what they call in poker FPS, fancy play syndrome, where I thought, no, uh, here I can squeeze out a little bit of equity and take another role play on for the game. And it was just a, a, a huge blunder. So I had this tendency and I already identified some other tendencies. So it's basically trying to identify my tendencies, write it down and try to have it present uh, to avoid uh, these mistakes in the future or reduce, minimize them because you cannot avoid them actually. Mm -hmm. It's always super interesting to hear how other uh, super high level players uh, approach this of actually improving because it's kind of like getting exponentially more difficult to get your PR (laughs) down. So it's interesting to hear that this is your approach and uh, facing basically what is probably now 
either the biggest or the second biggest backgammon match uh, on earth. I mean, I would say there's the world championship final mm -hmm. and then there is the UBC final, at least from a publicity point of view, mm -hmm. like the view count on YouTube. We, we had, I think, more than 100,000 views now mm -hmm. on the 12 matches from, from last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, you're really going to be in the in the top seat of backgammon. So, of course, you want to bring your A game. So it's mm -hmm. very interesting yeah. for me and probably for the viewers as well to hear how you're approaching this. Um, and so categorizing mistakes do you categorize mistakes from your online matches as well or do you only take like your live tournament matches yeah oh yeah uh, i mean if if it's a mistake uh, where i think oh this one is a typical dirk i mean this this one is just uh, i do it over and over again and then uh, that makes it more interesting so i mean if the mistake or if i can learn something out of the position it doesn't matter where it comes from so okay yeah even when i practice against xg uh, and xg makes a move uh, that i would never have made in my life uh, and it's interesting because it's something that comes up uh, frequently then it can also go into the database so it's not all doesn't have to be by me okay um another tangent subject here uh which was kind of a a, a narrative in in this year's ubc was this whole live versus online play mm -hmm. because it's the year of the COVID, so everybody had been playing online for a year a year and a half mm -hmm. and very very little live play and we even saw um the young gun ryan rebello mm -hmm. who actually got his grandmaster title from both that uh, from bmap after the tournament uh had way higher expectations to his own game mm -hmm. that he actually yeah, performed yeah. At. there's just a discrepancy there how do you see this um and i think many actually suffered from this they've been playing online but no live yeah. what's your perception on this topic yeah it's, it, it was difficult actually i did some practice uh, i uh, played uh, just before the ubc i played one euro shred with friends of mine uh, and recorded everything and so just to see how my live play is doing it was okay uh, at least in that shred but so uh, but it's it's, uh, it's 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 different and what i will also do i will uh, invite uh, some uh, friends uh, from the German national team to my backgammon office to play some live matches just to yeah to, to be it's really different and I can can understand everybody who had to struggle with this uh, change of what is it that makes it different it's the same game uh, first of all, when you play online, usually you play in your comfort zone. You're sitting there, I mean, if you take it seriously, let's say not like uh, late at night in bed or something, but uh, when I play online, it's in my comfort zone. I play in my office, I have uh, beverages, I'm uh, totally focused, no distractions, and the life environment, there's always something going on, or the match gets delayed, or lots of... Uh, disturbances that you have no influence on. So that is uh, a factor that you have to deal with. So you're out of your comfort, comfort zone. And then uh, online play, you have the pip count. You don't have these interruptions because of an illegal uh, roll of dice popping out of the board. Then also you have to pay attention to the legality of your opponent's moves. Uh, uh, sometimes they move forth and back. I do that myself. But then uh, you have to check uh, online. You know there can't be an illegal legal move or anything so a lot of uh, more factors that can distract you from playing your a game i would say yeah i totally agree i would even add to uh, to I, I would add one extra feature i think mm -hmm. there's something visually different like mm -hmm. it our pattern recognition reacts mm -hmm. differently if we're not accustomed to it mm -hmm. uh, i i saw an interview with the kasparov the chess uh, legend and he he said he told a story where he made a blunder again in, in one of his first matches against Deep Blue, uh, where it's just like an obvious blunder. Yeah. And when he saw it on a real board afterwards, he's like, I can't believe I made that move. But mm -hmm. he didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. there might be something with our pattern yeah. recognition as well. Yeah, absolutely. And also, your online board always looks the, the same. In a live uh, format, the boards are different. 
uh, from each other, differ from each other, the surfaces. I mean, they are all nice, the galaxy surfaces, but they are, they are different. So uh, there is something you don't have always the same board. And what is very important for me is the light, for example. When it's a little bit darker, when it's not, not enough light, I feel uncomfortable. So that's another factor. So you can really find a zillion factors or if the chair is not high enough for me, I don't have the right angle and all these things that can bother you that simply don't happen if you simply play always on the same computer screen. Yeah. And what about this, uh, the pip count? Um, that you have to count your own pips. Mm -hmm. How big of a factor do you think that is? Yeah, I'm, I'm not very good and very fast at counting pips. So for me, it's it's really nice uh, to have it always present. Uh, other people who are uh, like uh, these counting wizards, they don't care that much. But I think that is in part compensated uh, by the fact that you have got more time in live play. So in online, you have a minute per point, and in the UBC format, it's two minutes. So I think this uh, this equals out. So I don't mind so much the pip count. Most of the time, it's you don't need it anyhow. You just need to know who is ahead. So you don't need the exact numbers. So rarely do you you do so. Yeah. So it's not such a big factor, I think. Okay, let's jump to a new topic, Dirk. Um, of course, everybody in the community now knows your name, but uh, I'm fair. I wouldn't say I'm new. I've been in the community 15, 20 years or something, mm. but I hadn't heard of you until recently, actually, a couple, maybe three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's because you had a big uh, gap in your backgammon career because you're not a newcomer to the game. You're actually an old timer. So yeah. <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit about your backgammon career and how yeah. and how you, did you become this good at, at backgammon? Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I learned the game like at the age of six, very early, played with my brother and uh, and also played other games, all kinds of games. And like most, uh, I ended up uh, with chess because with the other games, there's just no way forward. And then uh, there was just a one in a million shot uh, coincidence. I made a civil service in a biological institute uh, in somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So much time to spend and my boss in that institute happened to have a copy of McGreal's backgammon so and he lent it to me and I had all the time in the world and I was studying reading fascinating and wow what I mean that game is really something and really interested me a lot and I also was lucky enough that there were some local tournaments um, by that time so, and that is how it started out. Uh, what are we in, talking here? Early 90s, mid 90s? Yes, 89, 90, early. I think I won my first trophy uh, in the beginning of 90, I think. So I started out playing tournaments in 1990. Yeah. So okay. at the age of 20, basically. Uh huh. And then there was the second thing. Um, okay, so I played tournaments and uh, became uh, reasonably successful quickly. That also helps, of course, to motivate you. And then I went to university and I opened a backgammon group in the university sports uh, section because they had go and they had chess. And so I started a backgammon group. And so like the second day to a uh, second time, Two guys came in, one Andreas Humke, you probably know him, and Johannes Lebermann, uh, who is not playing right now, although I heard he has started out on Galaxy again, I told me, okay. playing. Good. And so now all of a sudden I had friends uh, with whom to go to tournaments. So then we also started traveling together, studying together. So we were just uh, the studying group. And like even before uh, computer programs were out, we had this, this position cards, like uh, you can see it, like things like this. Uh, Good old proposition <laughs> cards. Exactly. And we were even transcribing our matches. Like uh, we, we were all coming from chess. So we would play matches and wrote everything down. And cool. So, so that was like 92, 93, even before Jellyfish came out. And so 
Yeah, so wow. it, it started in, and I think we were among the first ones then when Jellyfish came out to really use the program and uh, categorize positions. Uh, I already had mid 90s uh, a database of second moves uh, with Jellyfish rollouts and all kinds, kinds of stuff. So in that sense, we were a little bit ahead of time and we had just this edge that made us uh, successful and uh, really competitive. And by that time, I also could live from it, which was also a big factor, of course. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so oh, so many questions. What, how did you make a living from it? Just from money games or traveling to tournaments? Or Tra I mean, it was just a mixture, uh, traveling to, tra to tournaments, um, but the equity from tournaments wasn't enough. Uh, I, then also it was... Uh, completely normal at that time. I mean, people that go now on tournaments or are newer to the game just can't imagine how much side action, money gain action were there. I mean, it was a completely different time, different different atmosphere. And yes, uh, money game sessions uh, formed a big part. And then the uh, then uh, Games Grid came up, the first uh, real server where people played for money. And so, so I played- And what year was this? Oh, that's uh, maybe 95, 96, when, uh, but yeah, mid 90s, I think uh, this, uh, maybe even, even earlier, I think GameSpring is even older. But I remember that very early in the 90s, I already played the money games online. So that was also part uh, of, of the job, basically. Uh -huh. And the jellyfish rollouts. Jellyfish came out. Was that was also about mid nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. How did you save these rollouts? Did you take screenshots, or how did that work? Um, or could you like yeah, output I, it I, in I, a format? Or I, I let me check. I mean, I should have my jellyfish rollouts <laughs> in my own cube folder. I mean, everything ordered and like uh, look quite professional, like printouts and. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so I don't know what was that about. So that was level six rollouts, and yeah, I have here like the table of contents, blitz doubles, crunch doubles, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so wow! Like, uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, with yeah. I could imagine that you were <laughs> digging deeper in the theory of backgammon than basically anybody else in the mid nineties. Yeah, I mean, the, that is, um, uh, we had for a time, I think, a distinct advantage, and later on, everybody did it, or some kind of uh, uh, system how to analyze positions uh, systematically, but. Uh, at the very beginning of the computer programs, Johannes and me, I think, uh, were really just a little bit ahead of the curve. And that was enough to give us uh, a really good advantage in the money games. When I had uh, Will Snellings on the podcast, he said he, he I believe it was Walter Trice, but um, now I don't remember, who, mm -hmm. who actually made a rollout program, but it didn't uh -huh. play back gammon. It just set up, uh, you could set up a position and then you could play it yourself. And then it kind of ah, kept track okay, of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you I could mean, even make truncations mm -hmm. and just give it a result of an equity okay, when you reach cool. a certain position. Yeah, I never but had it's... the patience. For, no. <laughs> for hand you never did too. hand rollouts? No, no. I, I once tried it 36 times and I just uh, didn't have the patience. So. Yeah, <laughs> understandable. <laughs> but you did do uh, handwritten prop proposition cards, though. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That was when you were out playing. Uh, and a position arose, then you put it down. Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote it down. And yeah, when we are playing live, and just to, I put it on the card, and uh, we were discussing it later. I mean, without computer programs, it's just like uh, our most educated guesses. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just old enough to remember the prop proposition cards. But mm -hmm. when I started, the thing was the digital camera. Mm -hmm. People were uh, like bringing that mm -hmm. digital camera out and mm -hmm. take, a, take a photo. And then quickly mm -hmm. the people started with webcams and action mm -hmm. cams and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Oh, yeah, I had ah oh, yeah, I had my VHS recorder. I mean, I still have photos uh, <laughs> a match against Martin Davis where you can see me and my big VHS uh, uh, camera. So I had all these these tapes and I transcribed that stuff. 
just like nowadays uh, uh, into uh, yeah into jellyfish it was by that time, or was it already snowy and once i recorded a, a 20 hour money game session against ralph jonas uh, everything we call it like uh, yeah, 15 hours of tape or something. And, yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. Do you, what do you reckon your PRs were for you and Johannes back then mm -hmm. in the mid-90s? Well, I think uh, it could have been uh, towards the end of the 90s. I think they were already below four, at least the few matches that I have that uh, I uh, then to pass to uh, XG. Uh, yeah, it should be at around maybe a little bit below four or something uh, in that range would be my best guess. But yes, uh, not I enough matches to, to really get a good sample. I remember that Snowy, uh, that was Snowy 4 uh, mm -hmm. that I used. That was like the current uh, AI mm -hmm. when I started playing. Mm -hmm. It had, I think it was 4.4 .4 as the cutoff for world class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's even a little bit more generous, the yeah. Snowy uh, three-ply analysis versus the Extreme Gamma mm -hmm. uh, analysis. So I, I reckon Snowy 4.4, .4, is probably like 5.0 or something mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. XG++. So the, 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 uh, the borderline for what we categorize as world class has mm -hmm. been going down, mm -hmm. of course, uh, over time. But f obviously, around 4.0 in the late 90s would have been absolute mm -hmm. world class. Uh, I think it uh, was even a little bit better. I, now that you say it, uh, mention Snowy, I, uh, there was a work, like a beam up ranking there from Harald Johannes back in magazine. And I think I was leading it with like, uh, the 3.1 on snowy so that should be worse oh, of wow. course in uh, in xg but uh, uh, yeah uh, not much so maybe i even played a 3.5 just uh -huh. hard to tell now who were the other top players in the world at that time late 90s uh, yeah of course there was jerry grandel very famous uh, but he is i don't know what he's doing right now neck ballot uh, also not playing anymore i mean there there is there was wilcox of course who came back like many others that uh, now came came back johannes and uh, the usual su suspects that were always around like like mike sankiewicz and all, all these guys that never quit uh, i think uh, they were at the top neil caseros and uh, for sure i'm forgetting some names uh, but uh, yeah, Ralph Jonas, of course, as well, uh, always around. Uh, and yeah. So what about the Danish crew? Uh, oh, yeah, the, and the Danish. Gus Hansen, they, they, Mass yeah, Anderson, they, they, they Gordon Hall, yeah, Thomas yeah, Christensen. Yeah. Thomas Were they up there? Uh, they, uh, and the best uh, uh, memories I have, uh, uh, there was um, uh, Gus, of course. I remember I played him a money game session on my 27th birthday in Copenhagen. So that <laughs> must must have been 97 Copenhagen tournament. Uh, so, uh -huh. so we played all night in the club uh, in, in, in Copenhagen. So Gus was around. Brian Elgard, uh, oh, yeah. strong player. Oh, Martin yes. Holm, of course. But I think like uh, guys like Sander, uh, they came a little bit later than, <laughs> than that. Uh, at least I can't remember. And Lars Travold also came a little bit later. And Christensen, I'm not so sure. Also, I think after 97 as well. At least they were not in this club where we always played in Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah. There, I, there are there are a couple of years younger, Christensen uh, and mm -hmm. Sander. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, Falafel? Was he around back then? Yeah, Falafel uh, was, uh, I, um, yeah, that's a fun story. I already told it, but uh, um, actually Falafel considered me as his creator because there was this story uh, because uh, he played uh, in 98, it was World Cup Dallas in 98. He played, uh, uh, I think, the crocodile in New York. I think he won uh, quite a bit of money. And then he came to Dallas with Abe Mosseri. And they were there. And I started playing money game uh, with Falafel. 
And there's also a picture still, I think I have it on my Facebook posted. Uh, and we played the money game every day, basically. And we also played Johannes and we also made bets. Uh, I mean, you know, he loved uh, to make uh, bets. And so we always made when there was a position. I mean, this is also nowadays, it's not so much uh, in fashion anymore to make a lots of bets. I think on tournaments, on plays and anything. But there it was very fashionable. So we uh, each uh, decision, we made a bet uh, for $200, I think it was. So it was a significant amount. And I won the first 17 bets. So that, <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, okay. that, that, that got him really riled up. And, and he really was like, uh, oh, man, there's more to this game. And I want to beat this guy. And, uh, uh, and then he really started uh, taking the whole thing seriously and uh, we continued making bets and all of a sudden he won all the bets so he got really motivated and he uh, sh uh, shortly before he, he passed away we had the conversation on Skype and he said to me yeah the good old days and uh, yeah you were really my uh, motivator this thing with the bets and so he remembered and in a way he he thought uh, johannes and me we were like we kicked off his career or gave him the uh, the incentive and the motivation to to get really good and beat these guys huh? uh -huh. so, uh, that's a yeah. great story super cool story um, okay, so what happened next, Dirk? Because then you kind of just left Begammon for yeah, a decade and a half. Yeah, yeah Begammon kind of left me because it was always my uh, game of choice. But I really, like 2003 already, I really had difficulties to get action. I mean, the whole business model was uh, uh, traveling to tournaments, get some money, game action, playing online on servers, and my action really dried down for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so I had to, to do something else. So I was thinking about going back to university. I was studying mathematics uh, for a long time by then, and uh, maybe going back to that. But then these uh, the poker boom uh, started. Everybody Everybody was playing poker and already in the 90s I, I went to Las Vegas twice a year to play the tournament and I always also played poker and gave myself poker education I'm always like having like a set to, to maybe develop a second track and now poker became so popular especially online poker uh, that uh, I then just uh, switched to poker another reason was also um, my then girlfriend and now wife uh, got pregnant Pregnant, and so uh, I had a family all of a sudden, great. And I moved to Costa Rica. She is Costa Rican, and from Costa Rica, uh, made no sense to travel far to tournaments. And with a baby, you also don't want to travel, you want to be at home. So I was just sitting there and did my nine to five uh, online poker job. Okay. Uh, that was just, yeah. I mean, was okay. It was was okay in the economic sense, but the poker was never my game of choice, so to speak. Okay, I mean, we have to remember that uh, ninety nine point nine percent of poker players they are losing. So mm -hmm. uh, you must be talented in that area as well, since you could make it your your yeah your I mean, professional I some, work. Uh, so how yeah, did that? But, how did you how did you get good at poker? Yeah, I, as I said, I went to, to uh, Las Vegas on a regular base. So the first thing that I did, uh, 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 I went to this store in Las Vegas, the Gambler's Bookstore or something, and bought like, like 15 books on poker. So I bought all the literature and, yeah, did the same that I did with Beckham. And, and Johannes was also playing poker. So now all of a sudden we were discussing poker hands as well. And... <laughs> So it, it got started the same way. And when it got really popular, poker, I was like not very good, but I was the uh, one of the one-eyed among the blinds, so to speak. <laughs> so that was just the period where the advantage was biggest. Like in the beginning of the backgammon career, it was the same. There was a window, although I wasn't very good, uh, 
I, I, I still, relative to the competition, I was really good. And then when the competition got tougher and tougher in poker as well, like six years later, maybe 2000, 2010, 2011, I already noticed with the same effort and even more effort, I didn't win even half as much because the relative advantage was uh, getting smaller and smaller. And there it came out that I'm not such a strong, not so talented for poker because no matter what I did, I couldn't get back to this really big advantage, bigger advantage. So in the end, I sort of lost interest because if you are not so fond of a game, then it should give you at least some prof financial profits. And if the profits go down, also the motivation goes down. So in the end, uh, that was the end of my poker career. Okay. So that's when you came back to Bagamon. Yeah, basically I had uh, like a long time out or I got back to Germany and yeah, stayed away a little bit from games. I still played some poker and then like in 2000, 2017, uh, Andreas Runke called me and said, hey, why don't you give uh, backgammon lessons? I have this guy, Phil Simborg. He asked me to become a teacher and you are much better in these things. Uh, so yeah, uh, why don't you try it? And then I said, well, I'm super rusty for sure. I didn't have XG by that time, 2017. I didn't know what it was, so I bought XG and was looking, yeah, because you never know. I mean, I also don't want, I, at that point, I wasn't sure at all if I could make it back uh, to a competitive level. So and then I started starting with XG. I think uh, to give you an idea, when I first started, I uh, after a break of 14 years, I started out with like a four point something, low fours, I would say. And then yeah. I clawed my way back, I, I guess. <laughs> yes. Are there any differences in your methods today than there was back then? Uh, now that you have XG available and on more, maybe more competitive online play, or is it more or less the same? Um, yeah, the approach to learning learning is similar now since XG has a lot more functions than the the, the programs back then, or at least I now use them. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's it's more systematic and now that you have all this, I mean, all this screenshot taking and making a database, and also since I'm I'm giving lessons, so I also created a database for giving lessons. So I think it's more systematic. And also the wild days are over where I just came home at five o'clock in the morning from the discotheque, uh, half drunk to play some money games, all this stuff. I mean, I mean, when I think about it now, it gives me goose pimples. That's, that's just, uh, that's not me anymore. So to yeah, speak. now you have an office. And you yeah, go to I have, work. A, I have an office. <laughs> I have family life. Yeah, I, yeah. It's it's different, and I think uh, I like it better the way it it is now. But I, I guess back back then I would have said, "How boring!" Yeah, <laughs> how could you do that? So it uh, depends uh, on the attitude. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, and good. Um, exactly. before we move on, I, I have one more question about the, your poker career. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always fun to hear when you have like a uh, top top level backgammon player and who's also a professional poker player and you've been in both worlds what do you think is the differences or the difference or the the differences uh between the two games both from like a game theoretical point of view but also like a mental game uh, psychological point of view um okay from the game theoretical pro, uh, point of view poker is a lot more math based uh, game theory wise and all that because it's a, a game with incomplete information so it's uh, definitely more math based and for me from the practical point of view it was stressful in two senses what always uh, really bothered me in poker is that when i did let's say a bluff that didn't work out. I couldn't figure out, uh, was that correct in the game theory sense? Was I just unlucky to run into a good hand or was that action just stupid? And that is for me, backgammon is so much better. At least when you did something stupid, you know it afterward. And there was always like this doubt, uh, 
did I just get unlucky or did I play like a donkey <laughs> in poker? And in backgammon, you know, oh, this time I really played like a donkey and this, these were the mistakes. And in poker, there was always this uneasy feeling. And the other thing what was really stressful for me was uh, this multi-tabling. I mean, people were able to play like at 12, uh, 16 tables at, at once. And I couldn't do it. Four tables was just the maximum. I'm just not this quick, super quick guy. Probably Ryan Rubello would be like uh, be able to play like twenty or something, uh, but uh, I, I never could. I, I never could. So that meant uh, other poker players could compensate uh, by the amount of games that they played for the a reduced uh, return on investment, so to speak. Uh, but since I never managed to play more than a, a thousand games games a day, which is ridiculous. Uh, other players played like 20,000 a day. Okay. So then I really needed this big edge to, to make a, a reasonable income. And then, so it was very stressful for me to play on so many tables. And uh, I, I was really sort of glad when it was over. I mean, as long okay. as it was profitable, I didn't mind. But uh, I remember that as stressful times, so to speak. Yeah, I feel the same way looking back at my uh, gambling career. It's, mm -hmm. I kind of glad, glad it's over. <laughs> but uh, there's also cool stuff about it. How did you yeah. emotionally cope with being like a professional gambler for so many years and your income depending? Depends on how the the luck yeah, falls out. Yeah, I was always uh, too conservative, so to speak. So always, uh, I should have played for more money. Actually, and other players had the the opposite problem. They played too high stakes, and so they were very like uh, uh, had problems with the volatility and the bad streaks and got broke. But I. What I did was like uh, very systematically. I started out playing uh, backgammon for one German market point. When I thought when I won 200 points, I played two marks. Then I played five marks. So I always had like 500 points at least the bankroll. Even and when I played higher stakes, uh, I never was under stress in that sense that okay if that session goes badly, then I'm in trouble or anything. So and whenever. I won more than I spent. Uh, I also did some investments or savings or anything because knowing like a professional football player, you never know when your career is over. So you have to, it's not enough as a professional games player to win what you need for a living. You need to win more for the time maybe when there is no more action like it happened to me. First in backgammon, then yeah. in poker. So there's a lot uh, of considerations going in. So I was was more on the conservative side, and so I never felt uh, any stress in that area, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I think it's the same if you're an entrepreneur uh, mm -hmm. starting a company and you're mm -hmm. putting in a lot of hours. You know, it's yeah. the money. You know how precious the money you make are. You can't just go out and spend them all. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell my yeah. wife when she wants new back. <laughs> 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 With the yeah. mixed success, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you there. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Good example, by the way. Uh, I think opening a restaurant is not a lot more risky than what I did uh, with my games playing career. But since opening a restaurant is normal for most people, it doesn't appear very risky while well, my job always appeared very risky and many people uh, bought house on a loan and uh, yeah. i mean for me that was always super risky oh how could they do that <laughs> and they thought i was the the risky type so i yes. I, don't, I think it was just the opposite actually. <laughs> yeah but you probably had a hard time getting a bank loan right because you didn't no, have no, normal never, salary. Never, never never wanted one i mean that was yeah. a very relaxed relationship i was never okay. subject for credit and i I never wanted one, so that yeah. everything's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and is it different now? Or are you still living this way, or are you kind of getting more like in a traditional uh, income? Or yeah, I mean now since I'm giving uh, this, uh, I'm giving lessons. I have some income from some real estate that I bought in Costa Rica, and just uh, stable incomes basically, uh, and. Uh, uh, now I hope I will make some money with the book project. Uh, let's see. And like, yeah, 
that's uh, what I'm li- what we are living on right now. So yes, that's a good segue. Let's talk about your book, upcoming book. What's the title? Uh, that's the theory of the gammon. Mathematics, logic, and intuition is the subtitle. Very cool. I haven't read the draft yet, even though I know you offered it. I just d- didn't get it, and I didn't have time to read it. But I saw some glimpses of it, and mm-hmm. I also attended your seminar in in Marbella. Uh, where you gave gave a little sneak peek uh, of the book, and I'm intrigued. I mean, I'm gonna not just read it; I'm gonna study that book uh, yeah, because yeah. it seems to me, from what I've seen so far, that it's it's a very high level book. Can you tell us a little bit, a little yeah. bit about the book? Yeah, it's um, what what's for sure. It's very dense, a lot of information. But I also try to. I mean, theory of backgammon. It go. It starts uh, from the very beginning, like probability. What is equity? So there are also some basic, uh, basic cube strategy. So there are also some basic stuff in it in the so-called foundation part. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. It's not for beginners. Uh, you should have at least some experience uh, with the game, and it's just more like a com- comprehensive work uh, to understand the game, like also on a math-based track, a formal one, and uh, or more like on a track, uh, intuitive, logical explanation one, and putting these things together and uh, yeah I also try to for I think there is a black spot actually in literature back in literature in that sense that there is no complete systematic guide to how the cube for example relates to the game I mean there's a lot of good information out there for example when I started out I studied the bad as part from basics to bad as your book and I uh, your strategy, but I thought there were still some things missing. Like uh, uh, I had a hard time when starting out with all this match play thing again that I completely forgot about uh, to find enough uh, literature that went deep enough uh, to help me there. So in the end, the idea was also to write a book that would have helped me when I restarted uh, uh, my uh, career the book that i would have wanted to be out there so that's also part of it that's a great motivation to write a book that you're actually going to study yourself Mm -hmm. and i think that you're right i think there is a black spot i if i would have to uh, name somebody who maybe kind of did the same thing i would probably say danny kleinman yeah but that's like 30 years ago right and and since danny kleinman and and i wouldn't even recommend really that read the danny kleinman to to players nowadays um maybe if you're really hardcore uh Mm -hmm. uh, fanatic but since then i mean even mcgrill's backgammon which was like the bible for decades Mm -hmm. uh, it it doesn't go so much into game theory it goes Mm -hmm. a lot into strategy and this Mm -hmm. and that and concepts but i think you're right i think uh the the world of backgammon needs a book like this i I don't think there is another book and i I like the title that you chose Uh, i think it's very fitting so yeah I'm, i'm really excited um i mean this is a a comprehensive book you tell us something more about it what 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 did how did you come up with these things? What are the topics you're covering? Just the... okay. I mean, how did I come up? Uh, um, that was just uh, by coincidence. First of all, I, I mean, since I'm giving lessons, uh, there were sometimes spots uh, where I thought, oh, this is, would make uh, for, for a good book, or this would be, uh, would be nice to write it down and other things. And then I sometimes also encounter questions from a student, simple questions. <laughs> that uh, all of a sudden I started rambling around and that I couldn't answer simple questions about equity. What does it mean? Uh, I make a hundred blunder at this score. What does it mean? I couldn't answer the question. Uh, so, and then I found also, uh, I also found out it's difficult to find an answer. There's no book telling you that. So, right. uh, okay. But since I'm uh, completely, I mean, with uh, writing and editing layout, uh, I'm, I just cannot, couldn't do it. I mean, that was just, it's a, it's a world apart from me, but then- <laughs> Impossible task. Yeah, impossible task. But then again, another coincidence, uh, I made a back uh, seminar in Switzerland for a week. And uh, this guy, Matthias, now a friend of mine, gave a lecture on the theory part of the of, of, of backgammon. 
like all this stuff, match equities, uh, equity in general, take points, all that theoretical stuff. And uh, that was very nice, but he felt, and we talked about it, that actually I was the only one benefiting from that because in a lecture format, if you don't know about it already, it's so hard because it's math heavy and difficult to comprehend on the fly and in a lecture. So yeah, he was a little bit disappointed, uh, but I said it's just uh, it's just difficult uh, if you have to grasp so many theoretical concepts. So it's not uh, it's the matter itself. So then COVID started uh, one and a half years ago, and he gave me a call and uh, said to me, "Okay, I I think I I want to make a book book out of this lecture," and I said, "Hmm." Uh, that's a good idea, but I think that needs to, I mean, the, you need to put some meat to the bone, like uh, really also practical apl applications so people see that this stuff is really useful and just, uh, and so, and that became my part in the end. So we started this project together because Matthias is, uh, knows more about backend theory than I ever will. Uh, and okay. he's a very theoretical oh, guy. Oh, really? Uh, plays uh, uh, is a good player, but not world class, and but really interested in all these uh, theoretical concepts. So we were a perfect matchup. We started the project together, and actually three chapters in the book are still basically entirely his. And uh, on computer programs, he's also a computer expert and layouts, everything he did. So uh, that was the part that I couldn't do. He was perfect for. And then, because he also has a normal job, it was just too much work for him. So we both completely underestimated uh, the magnitude of a book project. Uh, I'm glad that I didn't know about it uh, back then, because <laughs> I think I never would have started in the first place. Yeah. And uh, But in COVID times, uh, lockdowns, you also had more time. So, okay, in the end, I took over the project. Uh, I mean, it was not a hostile takeover. He just said, uh, yeah, you need to <laughs> finish it off. Uh, and so now, but he's also on the book title. And, uh, and yeah, that's how it came into to being. And yeah. uh, so long answer to a short question, but it was just... Uh, not no, to be avoided, yeah. I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I think it's going to sell very well. Uh, oh, I, we'll, I, it, we'll I think see. it will. I, I'm, I'm happy with the baby, so I'm completely relaxed, and I had uh, some great feedback of test readers, so I'm not, not really nervous. I mean, the people yeah. who saw it liked it, so that's great. I, I think the book format is also fitting to the the advanced topics of game mm. theory. It's very mm. difficult in lecture format to, mm. like mm. I remember this from university, I, I studied economics. I didn't learn much from mm. the lectures, you know, mm. it's just difficult to absorb knowledge like mm. this. You want to sit in your own living room mm. and just absorb mm. it at your own yeah. pace. And uh, one, one of the things that the book is also for is to help people studying. So then when XG tells them, oh, at that score, uh, that was a big blunder to double, double or uh, not to double here, although it would have been a beaver for money. So people see that, but without uh, input from a coach, uh, how should they understand uh, what's going on? And that is also what, what, what the book is for. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and, and, all, yeah. Huh? and and this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this pursue pursuit of of getting to know all these theoretical things is not easy because there 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 isn't really a book out there you can just yeah, do it. Yeah. but one of the things i did was i actually read the source code from gnupagamon mm -hmm. <laughs> so i okay, figured out okay. how the developers of gnupagamon which is an open source project how they did yeah. it and i saw some of these functions mm -hmm. for instance the transformation function between uh, match winning chance to normalized mm -hmm. equity which is uh, something people yeah. don't really understand. So but, when they see the equity in XG and they make a mistake here and it's five away, three away, whatever, and then it's actually not the same at another score. Yeah, yeah, that's the second section of chapter five, I think. So that's okay. uh, like like twelve pages explaining all this. Uh, that's another thing. That's what the guy asked me. What what does yeah. it mean a hundred mistake at this score? And I couldn't tell the answer and also couldn't find out where to find it so uh -huh. i had to make the calculation myself uh, to uh, and, and so this is 
for example, one of the black spots, just what you described. Yes. Another big black spot, I think, is um, because we all are so used to see the XG analysis and uh, all that stuff. And sometimes we are forgetting the human aspect. So I have a whole part that just deals with non-optimal play. And, wow. Cool. And so what happens when not non-optimal players play against each other? And actually, uh, you can... Um, draw some conclusions that are actually really helping in, in practice. So I always try to bridge it not because what is theory only for theory's sake? I mean, it uh, has to have some practical uh, applications as well. Otherwise, it's just something for the nerds, I guess. That sounds very <laughs> cool. I think that's an unexplored topic as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, so many human versus spots. human. Yes, yeah. and, and there's yeah, a yeah. nice Magnus Carlsen's quote yeah. that he says that he's not really interested in playing against the computer because he's playing against humans. Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. Yeah. It's not... This, and even computers against each other, by the way. For example, a very simple thing. I, I, I'm surprised that never nobody got ever the idea before. I mean, everybody knows this reference position: six two double five, uh, dancing small pass. Uh, so, okay, make a rollout, put checker play on one ply for both sides, uh, and then it becomes a take. So that means interesting. Uh, um, if you play against me, I should take against you, and you should take against me for sure, because one play plays like a 1.9 PR, uh -huh. and already the, the attacking side of the blitz uh, has the more difficult decisions. So then what becomes a pass on the three, right, is a pass on three or play rollout already becomes a take. So the conclusion is clearly take more, in blitz positions against humans of the same strength, even not even weaker players than you, then what the UAXG rollout tells you. So that's wow, that's a super <laughs> nice little conclusion. So I hope the book is full of these little cool yeah, nuggets. Yeah, there, there, there are some, some nuggets in it. Uh, yeah, very cool. <laughs> this whole, the, I mean, um, I, I kind of went down the same uh, quest like you did maybe 10 years ago, so trying to understand them. And I don't claim to understand it 100% because mm -hmm. it's a very complicated system. But basically, <laughs> money game is rather simple, especially cubeless money game. But mm -hmm. then you add the cube to it, and the, that makes it way more complicated from a game theoretical yeah. point of view mm -hmm. with the Absolutely. doubling windows and how mm -hmm. volatility interacts and stuff. And then you add another one, which is the match score, mm -hmm. which again, a, a, a huge uh, complexity level. And now you have these, the, you have the cubeless game, you have the cube, you have the match score theory, and you combine it in like mm -hmm. a very complex space. That, yeah, uh, that, yeah that, that is exactly what the book is about, to, to just have, uh, uh, I mean, this is complex concept and I try to describe them as clearly as possible. And I did something that you did, uh, by the way, too, in Pure Strategy, which is, I think, very important. Like you, in the begin in the first part of Pure Strategy, you uh, gave some terms, some definitions like robustness, connectivity. So you develop the language to describe checker play decisions. And I dedicated a whole chapter just to create a framework of definitions so that you can talk about these things and understand them. So a formal de definition of, let's say, Rikuvik, because everybody talks about, okay, Rikuvik is big in this position, but everybody has a different concept of the thing. So just uh, you need a standardized uh, sort of uh, language so that you can analyze uh, the positions in the first place, I think. Yeah. And that is also missing. I mean, uh -huh. I, I, I made some research in, in the same page talking about Recubic. It was uh, on, on one page, uh, uh, on uh, one time it was a percentage, next time it was an equity. So it was just, I mean, there's no order in, the, yeah. uh, in what there is out there. So yes. Oh, I love it. I can't <laughs> wait, Dirk. Uh, you, I'm going to be one of your first customers, that's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of like the list that I wanted to talk to you about here. Mm -hmm. I'm only missing one point here in my notes, and that's okay. like, what? where do we go from here? What's your ambitions? How do you see backgammon? How do you see your backgammon career? And so on. 
I think, yeah, my own career, I mean, since I'm a living fossil, so to speak, <laughs> let's see where, where it still grows. So of course, I mean, this, uh, this event against Mochi is uh, the highlight uh, so far of my whole career, maybe even. And uh, yeah, my career is not that important, uh, except for me. Yeah? But uh, I think uh, the steps we have to take, and I think you guys do a terrific job because uh, to present backgammon in a way that uh, many more people get caught by it. Like uh, I have some experience with the transmission of the UBC contender. I mean, people, friends of mine who barely know the rules still really were caught up by the format and they still knew that it's bad when you get hit or something even they found it very exciting That's cool. uh, so i think uh, there is a lot of potential because to be honest i found it more find it more interesting than chess because it is a lot more dynamic and in chess you sometimes have these uh, games that uh, where nothing happens at all and after 25 moves uh, they settle on a draw so but in back heaven there is no draw there's always action there comes from people are coming from behind and actually it's I think a lot more attractive uh, if people would just know the rules and would uh, understand that it's more than just rolling dice and doing something. Uh, That's right. I think uh, the game itself presented like you guys do it uh, can be really attractive to a much broader public than it is now. So I think it has to go into this way to make it more popular uh, yeah, in general. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dirk. I mean, we're trying. Mm -hmm. It is the second most played board game in the world. It's mm -hmm. just that many people don't know that there's depth to the strategy. So exactly. that's kind of one of the missions that we have on Bagaman Galaxy. We want to show the world that what, what the Bagaman strategy is about and the Bagaman competition and so forth. And it kind of seems that uh, when, when people realize that, it's very easy to get them aboard mm -hmm. and start playing the game. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes, cool stuff, yeah. Dirk. Well, I wish you uh, the best of preparations. You've got yeah. more or less one month Thank now you. for yeah. for the final matchup. We're gonna broadcast it uh, on YouTube from the twenty sixth of November, and then twelve days every day we have one match like we did last year. It's gonna be played at the Wow Hotel in Istanbul. The co-sponsor is FM Gammon, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be awesome. We have a great setup ready with camera crew and commentators nick blazer is flying in from chicago to do the commentary alongside of myself so i'm looking forward to it as well so all the best Dirk. i hope you have Thanks get a lot. great great preparation and show up in in your yeah. a game or maybe even yes, uh, better than your a yeah, game that, that that's then the luck part if, if it's better than the a game i mean that's uh, i hope so but i will do the, i cannot promise any anything but i'll try my best that's the only thing that i can promise good uh, yeah thanks a lot mark good thank you everybody for watching remember to like and subscribe and uh, put some comments in there uh, i'll check them out as well maybe Dirk will even check out the comments and uh, we'll try to respond as well as we can i hope you like this uh, podcast and see you in one month for or a little bit more than one month for the ubc final 2021 bye guys bye, -bye. Hey. thanks for watching this video did you smash that like button Remember to subscribe and click on the notification bell to not miss out on future videos. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and my personal Instagram, Margolson10. And see you in the next video.